So thank you. We'll probably have to share this mic because of uh, potential sound tweak. So thank you genuinely from my end for making this uh, event as special as it is. Would be would be the event about the people. So um, obviously my name's Steve. Those people say hello. Okay, all right, Steve. I think yeah. Probably quite obviously you recognise me from from the book. So genuine story. I did think for a minute how you know I am, but it was obviously for obvious reasons. Now, the, the guy sitting next to me, um, we met at work, and I say this with genuine sincerity, he's the most humble guy I've probably ever met in my entire life, let alone, let alone in football. Um, so for all the young players in here, uh, I did a speech at Sussex School Football Awards on Wednesday. And I basically did a did a uh, did a speech, and I was telling the players that wherever, whenever you think you're any good, there's always someone's been a lot better than you. And I suppose when I walked into the building at Millwall, uh, of guys that played in the FA Cup finals, and it was quite humbling, really, to really keep your mouth shut and listen to what they're saying and, and learn. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure I have an opinion, but I think my lens on life from education. Uh, and football, of course, but from education has, has given me a perspective in pro football, which I, I thought there was a lot, there was a lot to do in football, and I think there still is. Uh, I don't say that lightly. Uh, football's made, making strides, but there, there's lots to be done. So thank you for for being here. So enough about me, um, Dave. The first thing you said was about there's a picture of you you couldn't get near him. So let, let's start with the FA Cup final. Yeah, hi, hello everyone. Um, great to be here. Um, yeah, Steve, you picked some, some really good pictures I think you can see there that I didn't really get very close to in the whole game. I don't think it's that good. Um, but yeah, that's probably the highlight of, of my footballing career. Um, was, was the honourable plan, you know, representing Millwall Club for the first time ever in, in an FA Cup final. So, um, you know, it was a privilege, it was a, a massive learning experience for me at the time. Um, I wish I would have occasionally more than I did. I think you, you tend to speak to a lot of players about things like that. And probably you need to take um, occasions like that more. Um, so, yeah, uh, excellent part of my career and, and uh, something that I'm very proud of and also my family's very proud of. Cheers. We, we, Dave and I normally speak every, every Thursday. It's normally he calls me and I call him and, and conversations can last from, from one hour to two hours just talking about football life and development. And, and I'll repeat that again, football life and development. Uh, they're three things that I think we're all really passionate about and, and, and it's really important that the message that we talk about holistic development and, and from my lens of elite athletes, uh, loads of coaches say I'm truly holistic um, but not always are and, and I can say this for the record that Dave truly cares about people as well as that. So we're going to move on to, to, to Dave's sort of start of his career. Um, Dave will explain where he started his career and, and how that journey evolved um, starting at Arsenal. Yeah, um, so um, I'll probably start a little bit sort of before that really. I, was, I consider myself to be very fortunate. Um, I'm a top supporter. I was born or I lived five minutes from the stadium. Um, I had uh, two parents that loved each other, um, two sisters that were very supportive of my career. Um, I lived in a, an area where I could walk 100 yards and there was a big green field and there was always a game going on there, no matter what time of what time of day, what time of the year, there's always football going on. And you know, I spent countless hours um, down in them fields playing football um, with very large groups, which obviously helped me with my football career. You know, I could be playing with seven-year-olds, I could be playing with 13-year-olds. You know, you have people constantly knocking on your door saying, is, is baby coming out to play football? Um, you know, I could play football in my back garden, I could hear the screams or the shouts and the terraces at, at, at the Tottenham Stadium, which also helped me when I was a very, very young lad. Um, and I was fortunate enough to, to get invited along to uh, the Tottenham's Academy. Um, I was with Tottenham from the age of seven until the age of ten. Um, and then the dark side, Arsenal, um, asked me to come in for a trial. And um, funny enough, my dad persuaded me to go. I didn't want to go, didn't have a Tottenham supporter. And it was the best decision I made because I was with Tottenham, uh, sorry, with Arsenal from the age of uh, ten uh, to the age of nineteen. Um, so. Uh, a good decision, good decision for my dad. Glad I've done it, and you know, worked with a lot of very, very high school coaches, 
uh, at Arsenal. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to make it through to, to be in Scotland there, uh, and then to be offered a professional contract before before I moved on to Millwall. Um, quick one for me really was uh, who did you play under at Arsenal and who were your cohort players that went on to have good careers? Um, in, in terms of in terms of coaches, um, Pat Rice, who I'm sure most of you will know, who who sort of moved up with Arsene Wenger when he when he came in. Um, he was a massive influence on my career. Um, punched me in the stomach every day uh, for about two years when I was a scholar, which you know I would recommend doing that now. But he also had three years to doing that, um, and he done it with a smile on his face, so you know I couldn't complain. Um, yeah, people like that. Uh, George Armstrong, um, who, who unfortunately passed away, was a big influence on my career in terms of moving me from centre midfield to uh, from centre half to centre midfield. And you know, you talk about luck. Um, I used to play centre half for the youth team. Uh, George thought I took too many chances as a, as a centre back. He moved me to centre midfield. Um, I played against Millwall, against Rhino. If you know that, Keith Stevens, um, and I kicked him all over the place. And he remembered me, and two years later he signed me for Mill. So, you know, we were talking earlier about five left wingers, someone asked a question about five left wingers and, and, and bits and pieces like that. If you've only got room for two and you've got a third one, you're pretty unlucky, aren't you? So, my, my career and my upbringing is, is, is filled with you know, huge moments of luck. You know, don't get me wrong, I've, I've worked hard, um, but sometimes you have to be in the right place at the right time. And unfortunately, I've, I've been in the right place at the right time more often than not. Um, and yeah, I'm very fortunate for that. Yeah, and just sort of tracking slightly to what Mike said about, so we've got some clarity and difference of clubs here. Chris Ramsey was talking about his lens from QPR that they might sign four left wingers. As an example, that would never happen at Millwall. So there is a huge element of luck uh, in football that does not link to Millwall. It's important to emphasise that. If you're just position specific and there's a player maybe that's just above you, what I learned coming from education into pro football, I couldn't believe that, wow, there's people here getting the right back slot and it works over a two year cycle. So obviously you above, you below. So scholarships work on a two year cycle. So sometimes you are just right position, right time. Um, I don't care what anyone says, I'll, I'll stick my hat in the ring on that one. So yeah, again, that's not necessarily what happens at other clubs, but at Millwall, for example, uh, of course, you've got to be a good player to get a scholarship, but at the same time, there's that two-year cycle where if you're just a left-sided centre-half and we haven't got a left-sided centre-half, then maybe, maybe you'll get a scholar when a right-winger is really good, but you might have two right-wingers. So that third right-winger drops into you know, non league quite quickly. So I thought I'd, I'd put that one in there, Mike. Um, right, Dave, so you, you left, you left uh, Arsenal at what age and then, and then joined me all and tell, tell everyone about your whole story, please. Yeah, just um, just backtrack. Sorry, just backtrack one question. So, you know, I was fortunate again talking about luck and being in the right place at the right time. I was fortunate to be in the same youth team as Ashley Cole, or albeit I was, I was a year older. And I still remember playing in the South East Counties, and we on the occasion we didn't have a left back, and there was number sixteen called Ashley Cole, who had been brought up as a centre forward of the league, had moved to wide left, um, and he was the next person maybe in to come and play left-back for team. And he was thrown in on the day, and he played very, very well. Uh, probably the best player on the pitch at the time. And he ended up getting a score off the back of that. So, again, just to backtrack a little bit, talking about luck, I mean, that's, you know, it was, it was very fortunate for him. Um, yeah, I, I spent 10 years um, at Arsenal, uh, worked my way through the edge groups. Um, you know, I was a UT player under Don Howe. Um, you know, what, what, what Don knew about football, you know, um, he, he, he knew everything. Um, great person, great teacher, made you feel great. Um, and I did my scholar and uh, was fortunate to be offered a two year pro. Um, and now I'm trying to get into Arsenal's first team, Arsenal being the manager. Um, I, I will train with the, with the first team every so often. And I always remember the um, first team coach at the time, Bora, come up to me um, at one point in the session and said to me, are you fit? And I was fit, I just weren't good enough to, to stick with these players. Um, 
you know, so I was trying to break into an Arsenal team that at the time was a midfield player had Patrick Vieira and Manuel, Manuel Petit, who had just won the World Cup. Um, my second position was centre half. We had Tony Adams, Steve Bold, Mike Keown, Jules Gramondi. <coughs> so the likelihood of me getting that side was very, very unlikely. So I knew that, and I had a great opportunity, like I said earlier, uh, in, the, in the reserve team at Arsenal. I played against Mill, had a very good game. Uh, they come back the next week, I scored two goals. Never done that since or before that. Um, they come back the week after that against Tottenham, I scored another goal. And I think that's when they decided that they want to sign me. So again, uh, you know, how fortunate is that? You know, how, how lucky you know, to, uh, to make that impression in such a, a, a quick space of time. And yeah, that summer, um, an offer was made. Um, Arsenal accepted it and I, I found myself uh, at Mill Football Club. And then started my journey as, as, as a first team player. And what a, a, an eye opener that was. Um, you know, I've gone from the change rooms, as Chris said earlier, where you've got, you know, all like minded, same age group as a scholar. You now sit in the change room where you've got a, a 35 year old that's played his 500 year, uh, sort of 500 game career, and you are there to take his spot. And, you know, that, that can be, a, a, you know, quite an awkward position to be in. Um, one of the first things I remember is, as, as, a, as, a, as a first thing about Mill, my first game, it's a pre-season game, uh, come off the bench, um, I went across into the midfield, went across the ball with the right back, opened up, hit a lovely 40 yard blow the ball, uh, out to the left winger on the other side of the pitch, felt pretty pleased myself, and all I could hear was Keith Stevens, the manager, shouting at me, and I sort of looked across the bench, and he said, never do that again. And I thought, wow, okay, don't quite understand what that means. Uh, next time the ball comes to me, um, bring the ball down midfield, drop it off to left back. Really, really pleased myself again, lovely bit of football. Look across the bench, manager Shan at me again, hook it on. So I went from, um, Chris is smiling because Chris knows what I'm talking about, but I went from, you know, being up, brought up at Arsenal where we were taught to play, play through midfield, like Chris was talking about earlier. But now I've got a hooker on in midfield. And if I don't do that, I ain't gonna play. So I have to, you know, I have to work out very, very quickly. Am I gonna do this? It goes against everything I've been brought up on, it goes against everything that I believe, but I've got to do it if I want a, a football career. So um, so you do it and you try and do it to the best of your ability and you learn to work man. And it, you know you find that they, it can also be a successful web plan. And yeah, that's the start of my my middle career, and and um, it sort of flourished from there. Dave, Dave, and I have spoken loads of times. I am so boring. I was bored into death of questions over five years, and just said, "What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And what was that manager like? What was this manager like?" And I was always fascinated. And Dave used to tell me like back in the 90s, late 90s, with, with similar ages, I'm slightly older, um, with similar ages, but in the 90s and the early 2000s, who was like tactically the best? And Dave will probably tell you a few stories, not necessarily with name and names, but I was just shocked that tactically it was just almost a little bit, I think. Why you go, lads, crack on. 4-4-2, as we all know, all the old people in this room, they yeah, played against 4-4-2, didn't they, really? 96 evolved and everyone started playing through at the back after Mr. Venables decided to do it. Now. So these 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 trends are happening in football. So we're going to pass you on really to sort of the manager part and the tactical elements and how many managers you played under, etc. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So uh, yeah, Keith Stevens um, was was my first manager. And like I say, it was, you know, it was Chris introduced me to a new phrase earlier which was mortgage football and what a great saying that is you know you plan for your mortgage you know so it, it was a bad one it was the pitch was not as narrow and as compact as football is now it, it was you know you had a um, center arse and there's your eight yard box you have a center arse and there's your eight yard box wide players and full backs out wide and it was a two for two in midfield and it was just a battle and it was about winning winning that battle it was about picking up second balls, it was about helping it forward, it was about getting the ball wide, getting the ball in the box, scoring goals. 
Um, so you're right, Steve, there weren't a lot of uh, sort of tactical element to it. Um, I think that's something that's kind of evolved uh, over the years. Um, I have worked under some, some great coaches. One of the best coaches was the late Ray Hartford uh, at Millwall. Um, talked to loads. He was a fantastic teacher of football. Um, you had Steve Grit, who was the first team coach at the time, who was a fantastic organiser. And then you had Mark McGee, who was fantastic at man management. You know, if you sort of roll all them three, I mean, them three people into one person, you, you probably got Jurgen Klopp, maybe, you know. So they were a great team. Um, we were very successful. We won League One. Um, and it's the season after we ended up finishing fourth in the championship and got beat uh, in the semi final. Um, Stern John last minute. That was our opportunity possibly to get to the Premier League, which was unbelievable. Um, and then sort of things peaked out a little bit from there. And then Dennis Wise uh, arrived at the football club, spent half a season or so playing with him, uh, and eventually he was given the manager's job. Um, and what I can say about Wisey is his biggest strength was how honest he was with you. And at times he would be brutally honest with you. And you would not be too happy about it. You maybe disagreed, but when you had a bit of time to yourself and you thought about it, you realised it was right. Um, and that's something I've always tried to do with players myself, is try and be honest, because I think eventually, or I think players appreciate honesty. Um, and then we had a, another great experience, like we've already alluded to, we ended up in the 2004 FA Cup final. Um, and again, from a tactical point of view, uh, a bit more organised, still, in the era where it was still a bit more fight football. We, we did play a little bit more, we, we changed to a diamond, which was great, and, and we started to pass the ball a little bit more, which kind of helped me, and, 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 and sort of my upbringing in football, I really enjoyed that period. Um, and then we ended up in the FA Cup final, and, and uh, the season after was, was a privilege to play in the UEFA Cup for the football club as well. So, I mean, over the years, um, I think it's more so when you start taking your coaching badges and you start um, thinking about sort of your career after your playing career, that you start to realise, you start piecing things together, you know, and it drops a little bit, you, you realise why, okay, that's why the manager's done that, that's why we prepared in this way, this is why we've done this training session. Um, and I think the game has evolved, and, and, and I think the game has definitely become a lot, lot more tactical now. Uh, and certainly for us at Millwall, we have to be because you know, we tend to not be as good as the opposition or as good as players uh, as the opposition. Uh, well, that's technically, technically or physically. So we have to make up the difference with how we how we stop the how we stop the opponents and, and what our tactics are to do that. Um, as you remember, staff. Just behind me, just 
absolutely letting the team have it, good, bad or indifferent. And my message really is the, the importance of having thick skin quite quickly in your career. Dave, as always, he says, would use the words I was restricted. So this is really to the younger, younger kids at the back. The four corner model exists for a reason. Technical, tactical, physical, psychological. And I think most of us would agree, if you're a good character, you're going to have got half a chance of a career. And that psychological corner is always, in my, in my opinion, the, the, the part that's missing. So really on to a question from me really is, is who is who is your best manager and, and why? Um, I'd have to say probably because of the player that he was um, and probably the way that he made me feel as a player probably was Dennis Weiss. Um, again, I think it comes back to that being brutally honest um, and caring about you. And I think Weiss has done that the best. Um, like I said earlier, the, the three coaches like the first time at, at Millwall, you put them into one person, you know, that's the ideal coach stroke manager for me. Um, I've already spoken about, about Don Howe and the influence he had on my career. Um, so, uh, you know, it's hard to choose one, um, but I probably just purely for the way that he made me feel, probably the person that made me believe in myself the most was this one. Um, Dave's got some brilliant stories, and I'm going to put him on it. I don't know what he can with him and can't with him, but I sort of love the one where you just went to Leeds and you were there for about a day, two days. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah um, it's funny because I've, I've only, yeah, I can't reveal too much actually because it puts someone in, in trouble, but um, yeah, we got to the point at Millwall um, where my, you know, the club had been relegated to one, um, I was ambitious, you know, I, I've been back in the, in the championship for four seasons, so I knew I could play at that level, um, there was interest from, from Leeds, and they just been beating the plan final at Watford, um, it would be a great opportunity for myself to go to a big club, um, any Mill support knows that you should move from Mill to Leeds United, Harry shaking his head, so that was an error straight away. Um, I shouldn't have better because I was there and I was there for 10 days and I then got transferred to Hulk. Um, thanks to <laughs> So I played two pre season games and I thought I played pretty well, but obviously not, so I ended up getting transferred to Hulk. Uh, that, was, that was difficult. Um, yeah, at the time, Kevin Blackwell was manager. Uh, the way it was explained to me at the time was he wanted to sign two St. Mithil players before he signed me. And they weren't available, so they signed me. Now they're available, and you're gone from sort of first, second choice, and we feel that to fourth choice. We've had our offer from Hull, what do you want to do? And me being me, always in my career, I wanted to be a player that earned his wages at the weekend, I wanted to play. Um, so I said, you know, if I'm not, I'm not going to be in the team, then you know, I'm happy to fight for it, but if you're saying that, you know, you're happy for me to move on, then I'll, I'll go and speak to Hull, and I end up moving to Hull. Um, and Leeds United got relegated for the championship that season, I was laid up. So that's a great team. Brilliant, 10 days, wow. Um, we're going we're gonna to hook straight on, fast forward to Dave's managerial career. So really just crack on with how it's evolved um, and interested enough. Not sure if you will notice Dave's management career started in, in non league. So a lot of few non league people in here, so it'd be good, good to hear this. Yeah, so. Um, so you fast forward a few years, um, I was just 30, um, I just had an operation on my knee, my contract was up at Barnet, um, at a crossroads sort of in my playing career, I knew that a big part of my game was my physical attributes and because of my knee, or my knees I should say, I, I could no longer be as effective on the pitch as, uh, as I would have liked. So, an opportunity arose um, where there was a potential for me to go to Histon, who were in the National League Premier at the time. Um, originally I was going to go there as assistant manager. Um, that fell through. I think John Beck wasn't too keen. Um, two games into the season he gets the sack and I was offered the job. So at the age of 30 I was offered the player manager role at Histon. Um, 
the caveat to that was I'd have to do a job for nothing. So that was a, a difficult decision to explain to my wife. My wife went to a bit about that, but I knew at that point that I needed to move on to the next part of my, my professional career. So I made the decision um, to, to take the role and you know, I walked into a football club that was, at the time, um, massively in debt. Um, every piece of the budget had been spent already, so every, every, every pound of the budget had been spent, so I couldn't make instant changes um, within deducted points. Um, so it was a real sort of baptism fire, really, for me. So um, it was a great decision. My first year as a manager, relegated. Um, but it was the best decision um, that I made for my next career. So you spent two years at Houston, and then you had the opportunity to go back to Mill as under 18s manager. So tell me how that evolved and, and, and how, how that evolved into you getting the, the assistant manager's job. Yeah, so um, firstly, at Houston, learnt loads, um, did everything wrong to start with, probably the biggest mistake. I made certainly my first year, or certainly my two years at Eastern, was that I decided that I would divide everything up. So physical was physical, uh, technical was technical, tactical was tactical. And in my head, um, that's how I thought things should be done. Um, through experience and working with different people and then going to work with uh, middle under 18s, you know, I learned to, we can do all them things with football. Um, so that was one of the big lessons I learned. I mean, I, I did so many wrong things at this then. Um, I'd love to go back now and do the job again because I'm much more prepared for it. Um, but yeah, two years there, relegation, second season, did okay, was able to make change, um, got the club moving in the right direction again, and then the usual peak kicked in. And it created a load of opportunities. And uh, again, just to, to show how fortunate I am, I played with the Kelly manager Scott Fitzgerald. Um, so I'm not ashamed to say that I, I probably got my foot in the door because of that link. Um, and I was given the opportunity to, to, to work with the 18s and I jumped for the opportunity. Uh, purely because I wanted to go and learn. Um, I didn't have all the answers. You know, I was a 32. Um, I'd be working with more experienced coaches, more experienced people than I am or was. Um, you know, working with a uh, head of coaching on the film training and you've learned loads. So uh, it, for me it was a no-brainer and I went back to the under 18s and, and met Steve eventually. And that was probably the biggest learning curve that I had. Um, and then two and a half years, three years into that role, the opportunity uh, came for me to, to progress my career again and, and step up and work with the first team. Um, and again, Fortunate, good friend of mine, ex-player, Neil Harris gets the job and he asked me to, uh, to go and work with him. So I keep talking about how fortunate I am and how lucky I've been, but at, at sort of important parts of my life and my career, I've always had that little element of, of luck. But what I'd also say is that once you get yourself in that position, you've then got to do good work. If you get yourself in that position by who you know, if you don't do good work, you'll soon be, you'll soon be back out the door again. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty much how. Um, Dave won't mention this. Uh, uh, I, I say in the book about how we define intelligence, degree, A license. <coughs> we've all had a doctor, and every doctor that we've, we've had has all got a PhD. And some of those doctors are rubbish, and some of them are really good. All the kids at the back, you've all been our teachers, and you've had great teachers, you've had okay teachers, and you've had rubbish teachers, and they've all got exactly the same qualification. And then we've got the coaching journey, and we've got the A license and the pro license, and we know that there's some A license coaches out there that are rubbish, and there's some A license coaches out there that are really, really good. So the reason I say this, and, and connecting this to the book and today's journey, is that one thing he's very, very unique at, is that like, posh language, but it's humanistic approach to, to, to life. And we know that football is just washed with egos. And at Mill, to be fair, if you are an ego, you'll get put down pretty quick as a member of staff. So that was probably culturally quite good for, for all of us 
in terms of working culture, that you know, we, we call it we not me all the time, making sure we're thinking about other people before you think about yourself. One thing I will say from, from my lens is that we've got a really interesting story and you probably won't remember this. They had a pair of football boots and they were, they were World Cups and they had a hole in about, about that bit. So this is not me killing Dave, but this is one of the moments when we connected and you don't realise it. was end of the season and he gets his boots and he puts them in the bin. We were at the training ground about five o'clock, I had to go home and I was like literally shocked with him. I go, Dave, what are you doing? He goes, well, put my boots in the bin. I go, you can't put a pair of boots in the bin, mate. Went, no, no, they got hold in. So I'm not killing Dave in terms of being putting the boots in the bin. I said, Dave, I'll take the boots. He said, why are you going to take the boots? So I said, I'll give them to charity. Like, there's loads of kids at our school. Yeah, again, from my lens, from my world, compared to his world, where if I get a pair of boots, they're going straight in the peak cover, and they're going to be giving to a kid that ain't got no money. So he said to me, wow, like, you know, I've never, I've never seen that before. And I was just like, no, Dave, that's normal. That you get a pair of boots with a little hole in and you give them to someone else. But that's a moment in our life where he don't remember, probably he's looking at me and don't remember it, but I remember it. And those boots, those boots went straight down the charity shop, my end, and, and were given them. And then the next pair of boots went straight to a pink department in, in, on the Woolworth Road that I knew a load of lads that I knew would need boots. So that isn't an indictment on Dave's, that's just Dave's lens and how, and how we see the world. And, and my lens was just saying, look, there's a pair of football boots there, a little hole in that someone can use them. So, they're, they're the types of things that, that, that when you work with different people is my message that you see a different insight into the world. And what, where I felt football was really institutionalised is football often only knows loads about football but not a lot about anything else. And that isn't about Dave or me or anything, that's just about football. So it's really important that you do try and surround yourself with people who do, who do give you a different viewpoint. So, last, last few questions really before we put it out to everybody. Um, you, you then get to the first team, and, and this is really important that you notice this. Uh, they, they, the first season you got to play a final, correct? Second season you get to play a final and win it. And then the third season as assistant manager with, with Neil the manager, you get to eighth in the championship. So that's not bad going, and then this season you stay up. So just a little bit on summary about, about that four year journey really. Yeah, so... Um, <clears throat> I think uh, at, at the time when we first took over, uh, just the club had just been relegated, and um, the remit from the club was we wanted to reduce the age of the squad, uh, we wanted to reduce the wage budget, we wanted it to um, connect the, the, the playing of the team, the field, the terraces again, um, and that was, and within three years we want to be back in the championship. That was kind of our remit, and. We were lucky enough to do it with, with in, in, in two seasons. Um, how did we do that? Well, we just went and tried to go back to some of, to some of the old mill values, some of the old mill traits. Um, and there's probably no one better than, than Neil Harris, who, who understands Mill Football Club. And we went about that way. So we brought in players that knew the football clubs. We brought Steve Morrison back to the, to the club, Tony Craig, uh, Jimmy Abdu, who was <coughs> out of favour um, in, in, under the previous manager was brought back into the fold um, and we promoted a lot of the UC players and the academy players through to the first team and, and that proved to be a successful mix for us. Um, probably the biggest learning curve from a football point of view is that we wanted to try and recreate some of the teams that we had played in so we wanted to be a high pressing, um, high pressing team getting after the ball early. Um, we want to be two front men, big one, small one. We want to play with wingers that are exciting, get the ball in the box. And we increase the size of the pitch. We thought that would be a good idea, increase the size of the pitch. And the season starts and it don't go too well. Um, you know, the team's not able to, to press high. Um, can't get that timing right. We don't have maybe the physical aspects to be able to play in that way. And so we ended up losing 4-1, I think it was, at home to Coventry, just before the first international break. And that was a big moment for us because it gave us a two-week breather in that national break. And we decided that the team can't play in the fashion that we wanted to play in. So that's probably one of the lessons that we had is that you've always got an idea of how you want to play, um, but then you've got to do almost that little gap analysis. You've got to say, right, I've got to do an audit. This is, where, this is how we want to play. This is what we want to look like, this is the vision, but where are we at the moment? And that little window of 
opportunity, uh, natural weight, just goes an opportunity to change the we played. And we very much then become a mid block team that can attack. And the reason we went that way is because we felt that the players weren't able to defend 1v1. Uh, had to play had to play close together, couldn't play far apart. So we had to change the way that we played and we come up with a way of playing that, that proved to be successful. And if we hadn't done that, um, I probably wouldn't be sitting here now sort of approaching that thing pre-season. Um, so that was very important. I think it's an important message. If you have an idea of how you want to play, but there's also a way that you have to play. And the beauty of football is then putting their building blocks in to eventually get back to the vision that you had in the first place. Uh, and that's the kind of journey that we've been on at the moment. Um, yeah, first season, fortunate enough to get to the power final. Um, everything that could go wrong went wrong before it. Um, we lost the centre half in the warm up and Brian Webster. Um, so now we have a little bit of a dilemma. And I, I don't mind sharing with this, with this little story. But So the next person in is Tony Craig, who's the club captain. And he was going to start on the bench that day. Steve Morrison was going to leave the team out. Centre half goes down injured. We're going to put Tony Gray back in the team. In the warm up, yeah. It's injured in the warm up. Um, so here's a question to you guys what do you do now? You've got the club captain who should be leaving the team now, but you've got the, he was supposed to be starting on the bench. You've got Steve Morrison who is the captain on the day. He's going to leave the team now. Who do you now decide to? Who do you decide? Is it Tony Craig, the club captain, or is it Steve Morrison, who was captain before the St. Mark got injured? And that was 10 minutes before the flower final. What do we do? Nothing prepares you for that. You know, there's no course that can prepare you for that. You've got to deal with it, yeah. You're all right. And you, you kind of hope the players deal with it. You know, your, your idea, you want them to take the decision out of your hands. So, little things like that did affect us. The game starts, and within three minutes, we're 1 0 down. Um, and we never really recovered from that. So that was a real disappointing way to end the season. Um, but our work for the next season started straight away. Um, again, lucky enough, we, the football club had the experience of the last time it was in League One, where it lost the League Cup final, a uh, playoff final, and the season after we won the playoff final. So we drew back to that, to that experience of us as players, and we decided after that game, we already started the next the mindset for next season. Next season we come back and we make sure we get the move. And luckily enough, season after we got to the final again and we, and we won it. Um, and we found ourselves back in the championship. Um, and then we did something that, albeit it was, was great, um, it's definitely harmed us this season in terms of expectations. You know, we finished eight, three points off the bus. And as a football club, whereas we had that plan at the start, we probably didn't revisit that plan again. So we finished eighth, and now this season, anything we do other than finishing high than eighth would probably be seen as an unsuccessful season. So this summer, we spent a lot of time trying to find what success means to us. Is success staying in the championship? Is that success for us? Um, second worst budget. I personally think finishing fourth bottom is second worst budget. Is you did your job. We were. An error away from an FA Cup semi final. Um, so that's pretty much the sort of journey we've been on from that point of view. Um, but it has, it's took a lot of soul searching this summer to just try and define what success means to the Mill Football Club again. And we don't have all the answers yet, um, but what it has done is it's made us ask a lot of the right questions, we hope. Um, and I'm going to see what happens this summer. Thanks. Just before I put this out, I'm just connecting this back to the book. In, in the book, um, I, I talk, there's a chapter called uh, Adding Value, which is our business type terminology and how, how we judge success. Success, how is it judged? Is it judged through obviously winning games? Is it judged through development, adding value, or is it judged through results and points? And I, and I say this, this is a question that you're going to have to think really deeply about. I write it at the start of the chapter. I say, would Claudio Manieri, the guy that won the Premier League with Leicester, would he have, this is a genuine question, added more value if the season after they won the Premier League, he got more points but didn't win the league? And we know that football is just such a variable amount of nonsense at times. So Liverpool, 
obviously everyone knows have been massively successful and whatever, people probably don't remember the, the chance that the ball had that hit the post that came back off the defender at Man City it was 11 centimetres from going over the line. I think that takes eight points clear, I think. Fine lines, we talk about every Sunday morning about fine lines, don't we? Every single Sunday, what happened this week, it was fine lines. So it takes, uh, we call it the trained eye, don't we? The trained eye to really know what you're looking at and, and observe in sport in such a more holistic way because you've got to have a, a, a massive amount of luck in football. And sometimes that luck is referee having a bad day, a good day, linesman missing something, etc, etc. So the variables of sport, so it takes a lot. So we'll, we'll open this to the floor. Can we just have a round of applause for Dave, please?